Happy Sabbath. Thank you once again for uh, joining us as we study the word of the Lord. So for those of you who are here and those of you who are online, I want to encourage you, as we have been doing these particular studies, to have a pen or paper ready, be ready to take notes. If you do need paper, uh, please reach out to our staff. We'll be happy to get paper for you. You have a pen or a writing utensil. Or if you have want to meet with me after church, and I'm happy to give you the notes um, for this, uh, today's study. Because today's study, we are going in Revelation chapter 8. So the title of today's study is Revelation 8, The Seven Trumpets, Part 1. So the Lord has blessed us with insight in relation to the trumpets, but there is so much that cannot be covered in one study. So we're going to have a part one and we're going to continue onward as the Lord leads. So before we begin, let us have a word of prayer and then we will go into our study. Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing us today with the reading and hearing of your word and the studying of it. And we ask you through your graces, O Lord, that today, even now, that you will help us, Lord, to cooperate with heaven, with thy Holy Spirit and thy angels, that we to receive the light in relation to this chapter, that you will be glorified. Help us to glean the lessons that we will be able to learn and put it into practice in our own lives, that you will be glorified and the world will be warned that you are coming. Please be with us now as we study this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so before we go into our study, we are going to read our text for today so we can read it, get a, uh, just get the grasp of it, and then we're going to go into each verse. So let us begin with re go to, uh, turning to Revelation chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 6 through 13. That's Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. When you have it, say amen. I want to make sure we're all here. Okay. All right. So, Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 13, it reads, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the, of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Amen. So as we go into this, it's extremely important to keep in mind that this is focusing on what we talked about before. I gave you an allusion to it in our, the first part of our Revelation 8 study, verses 1 through 5. I talked to you about the trumpets. I want to go back just for a brief moment on verse 2. We're not going to um, pull up on the screen, but we're talking about the seven trumpets. Previously, I gave you a bit of a definition that focused on how parties with military power were warring against the church. I want to go back and re-edit that. Because I want to, like, um, as looking further study of one, I find a better way to express it. It sounds, it is much better in harmony with what the scriptures were talking about. We talked about how the trumpets focused on, like, in this particular, were focused on going to war. That was the only understanding like, that made sense when you plugged it in the uh, Revelation 8 study that the trumpets symbolized as far as going to war. When you look at all the ways that trumpets were used in the Old Testament, this was the only one that actually made sense when you plugged it in with the context of the rest of the study. So 
trumpets in the Old Testament were test like um, were used as far as being able to parties going to war. It symbolized parties going to war. So in this case, we are focused on being able to elaborate it as times where parties that went to war and how they affected the church, how this war affected the church. So we're talking about times where parties went to war and how it affected the church. So how many parties does it take to start a war? At least two. So we are going to identify those two parties, and then we're also going to see the third party, the church, how they were affected by this. So you're going to kind of see this uh, same pattern throughout this entire um, study today. So those two parties and then the church, how it was affected by this. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and go right into our study. And we talked about the trumpets already. Let's go into verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So this is actually really interesting here because when you look at that, um, these uh, particular um, passage here, you see those, uh, you don't see people, you see symbols. So you see symbols. You see how the hail and fire mingled with blood was cast upon the earth. So already you see two parties, the hail and fire mingled with blood, that's one party symbol, and then you see the earth, the second symbol, and then you see that third party, how the church, like the church was affected. The third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. So you see three parties in this particular verse. And what we need to do is we need to identify who these parties are. We need to understand who they are. And that involves us being able to look at the symbols, hail and fire. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some digging so let's go into the, um, as far, we're going to look as far as what does a hail and fire mean? So let's take a look at the book of Psalms, chapter 18, 18 verses 12 and 14. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 9, verse 18 through 24. We're going to start there because this is the one that kind of stuck out to me first. That's Exodus chapter 9, verses 18, and we're going to go to verse 24, excuse me. And be, like, uh, it reads, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field shall not be brought home, and the hail shall, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of the Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, and upon man, upon man, and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. So... What are we looking at here? We're seeing, we're going to keep adding on to the case here, but if you were looking at it right now, I think you kind of have an understanding of what we are doing here. The last time that there was hail and fire mingled together, there was a plague upon the land. It was used as a judgment against a nation that persecuted God's people. Are you starting to see the pattern just a little bit here? So we see here that it is focused specifically on a, it is symbolic of a judgment. And what did it bring upon the land? It brought destruction. We see the same pattern here. And when you, like, let's look, because adding on to this, you see it in um, Psalms chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. And you kind of, you, you see the, um, the pattern here. It's, it, it's symbolizing judgment and destruction. Just one second. Let's go ahead and um, go to Psalms chapter 18, verses 12 and 14. Just 
turn in there with everyone. Just want to make sure that we're establishing our understanding here. And Psalms 18, verses 12 through 14, it reads, At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. So we're seeing judgment and destruction, hail and fire, and then it goes mingled with blood. And when you look in this, it actually symbolizes bloodshed. So we can see that in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 22. We're just going to keep adding on to the points here. Let's go to Ezekiel 38, verse 22. And it reads, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. So we're seeing how all this comes together. So this party is actually symbolized as judgment and destruction mingled with bloodshed and strife. So this party is bringing judgment and destruction upon the second party. And they were cast upon the earth. So this, is it, this happened upon, across the entire world? Is the world being destroyed by hail and fire right now? Not the case. Not the case. So this is referring to a party that was warring against this part. So it's referring to a world power. We saw just a moment ago in Exodus, we talked about how this party was receiving judgment for persecuting, persecuting God's people. So what party is it talking about here? What party was persecuting God's people at this time? In the context, John the Apostle was um, being persecuted for his faith, wasn't he? He was on the Isle of Patmos. Who did it? What empire did this? Pagan Rome. Rome was that, is that party that is symbolized by the earth, the world power. And this party is bringing judgment and destruction upon it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is this party like, uh, as bringing judgment and destruction? Judgment and destruction means the destruction of Rome. So what has to happen here is that it has to come to a time where Rome is being destroyed during that time period. Judgment, but also destruction, the destruction of Rome. And we know that Rome was destroyed in what year? 476 A.D. So we have to go around that time to determine who this party is. So we have to look at Roman history. This is where the Lord is blessed here because I had to kind of get the history part. The Lord is blessed me to be able to receive certain elements as far as understanding the word, but it's incorporating that historical part. And I think I told you about this before, is that the Lord, um, he told me at one time to grab a study, like a, a study I had. Um, it's Revelation Seminars. And it had the historical part onto it, but I kind of ignored it. And what happened is, is that my understanding of his word was completely thrown off apart from, like, uh, apart from what it should actually have been. Why did that happen? Because I did not listen to the Lord. So just a, uh, just a uh, lesson here. For a study to be successful, for you to understand these things, especially in relating these things to history, you have to cooperate with heaven to be able to understand. You can't just accept things just because I say them. You can't accept them because someone else says them. You have to cooperate with heaven to be able to understand what these things mean. So I studied on this um, particular portion of Revelation seminars, but I didn't just take it on its face. I had to go back and look and find out how, like, you know, where in history did this happen. So when did this happen? Did it happen in the... Uh, first and second centuries of the Roman Empire, the time of Pax Romana? No, it did not, because that was between 27 BC and 180 AD. It was a time of Roman peace. You don't see, you know, peace happening during, you know, judgment and destruction. What about the early part of the, um, actually their greatest land, their land grab, the greatest territorial expanse they had during that time was during the period of Roman peace between 98 AD and 117 AD. What about the, um, the early part of the 4th century? Well, that can't be it. Like around the 300 ADs, that can't be it because Christians rose to power 
and about through the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Well, we got to go a little further down. What about the migration period? And that was in 375 AD, where they had large-scale large scale migrations of Germanic tribes migrating into Rome that ultimately facilitated the fall of the Western Roman Empire and later on the settlement of its former territories by these Germanic tribes. Sounds a little more along the lines here as far as their judgment and their destruction? Sounds a little bit more right. So we have to, like, um, whatever party is being symbolized here, it has to happen between 375 A.D., and 476 AD. So now we, we've got an understanding here. We now we have it had to come at a certain time. So what party would that be? So the Lord showed me this, and it was um actually what party fits the description? In 410 AD, Rome was sacked, plundered by Alaric, king of the Goths. It's between like, uh, 375 AD and 476 AD, right? So it's right within, right within that time frame. This was actually seen as a major landmark in the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Now, I had a question here. Is, like, the Lord has been this question here. Because like, the thing is, this prophecy was written in 90 AD, right? John wrote the book of Revelation in AD 90. And the sack took place in 410 AD. Right? So it's about around 320 years they had this, like, um, they had this knowledge. Um, turned, like, how did they not know? How did they not know about this? Go to Genesis 18, verse 25. Genesis 18, 25. I want, I want us to kind of look at this. It, 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 it begs the question. And it reads, that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What is happening here? How are the righteous slain as the wicked? What is happening here? I mean, we understand that it was written in AD 90. And Revelation 1 verse 11, I'm just going to turn there myself on this one. And it says something here. Revelation 1.11 just lays it out here. It, we receive a certain instruction. John received a certain instruction. And I'm going to read that for you very plainly here. He gave him plain and simple instruction. It says, Jesus is saying, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write it in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So we're seeing here that the, the Lord instructed John to send his revelation to the seven churches. And they had to have spread to Rome by that time period, because these are all Roman-occupied territories. If they had been studied and understood, they could have been known uh, they could have known about the fall, the fall of Rome. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So they had the means of knowing. And, but what happened? How did they not know this? There is a reason here. Because what happens is that they were going to know the prophecies are, are given of events to come. The understanding of these events were meant to be understood before the time so they could take the necessary measures so they wouldn't suffer under it. It wasn't meant to be, to, to be understood after the fact. Oh, we, got, we were plundered, we were harmed, and you, you discover this 100 years later? Man, if we had to listen back then, what good is a prophecy if it's not understood before the time? Well, what good is it? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. As far as you know, it's more about the, it came after the fact. But the fact was, this was at a time that spiritual apostasy had taken place. If you look at Revelation, we're not going there. If you look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it talks about the church in a time of spiritual apostasy, that black horse. So what was happening is, is that the locus of authority for God's people was shifting from the word of God to these pagan-derived traditions of men. There was a, a, local, like a shift of authority from the word of God to this apostasy, this mingling of the true and the false. So people were focusing on these pagan-derived traditions of men rather than the word of God. 
And as a result, they did not study the scriptures. It was, the study of the scriptures was forsaken for the traditions of men, and they did not seek to restore this severed connection to the scriptures through the destruction of Rome. So they had the knowledge of the destruction of, of Rome, but they weren't studying the scriptures. They completely just turned away from it. They had the, um, the, the knowledge of the prophet. They had the knowledge of these things before in advance, but they completely turned away from it. And as a result, they suffered. So we see in um, just in Revelation chapter 8, kind of going back to it just a, for a brief moment here, there was a suffering here. Give you one second. I want to make sure I turn to the right page. Yes. So... And it reads just once more, once more we're going to go right back to it. The third part, of the, again, verse 7, the third part of the trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. So that is symbolizing God, God's people are being symbolized as the trees and the green grass is referring to desolation. So God's people were, many of God's people were killed, a third of them, not all of them, because when you're looking at it, it's only mentioned the third, not everyone. You'll see in this prophecy and throughout the Bible that when things are mentioned three times, it refers to completeness. So you'll see it in earlier verses, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you see completion. But only a third of them were burnt up, slain. And the grass is referring to desolation. So what happens here is that God's people, as a result of these two parties warned against one another, many of them were killed and they were made desolate. They suffered under these rough times. Why is this? Because the judge was, I mean, they were judged and made death because they cut themselves off from the only means they had of escaping the judgment that fell upon Rome. In the past, they were warned of the destruction of Jerusalem in the days of Jesus' ministry. If you look at Matthew 24, verses 15 through 16, Jesus told them upon the Mount of Olives that when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place where it should not stand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. They successfully taught the church this from AD 31 when Jesus gave that prophecy all the way up to AD 70 for, for nearly 40 years. They had taught the people this, um, the, this the word of the Lord, taught him the teachings of Jesus Christ. And what happened? When the sign came, when the gates were open, the Roman armies were fleeing, the Jewish forces were pursuing, the Christians got out of there. And as a result, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. The Christians in the days of this sack of Roman 410 had nearly eight times as much time. Almost 40 years, they successfully studied, passed it down, and they were saved. They had nearly 320 years, no one studied, and as a result, they went under this, this time of destruction. So we're having to learn something here. There's a difference between these two parties here. The difference between those who were the Christians in the time of the fall of Jerusalem and the days of this judgment upon Rome was their study and application of the word of God in their lives. So it is the study and the application of God's word that saved them back then. It is going to be the study and the application of God's words in our lives today that is going to deliver us from the final judgment and the second death. We have to study and put God's word into practice in our lives. If we don't do that, then what happens? We suffer right along with the wicked. So let's move forward here in our study, and we're going to look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 8. Let's read that one more time. And it says, And the second angel sounded, and as were a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the, the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And when you look at this, it is, you have to look at it here. So now you see parties again, once again symbolized by certain elements, and not actual, like, it's not an actual mountain burning with fire, but it says a great mountain burning with fire, that's one party, was cast into the sea. That's the second party. And then the third part of the sea became blood. You see the third party, mentioned in verse 9. We'll get to that. So this great mountain, this mountain is a symbol of a great, um, king, a great government or a great nation. 
You can see that in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and verse, like, uh, chapter 25, verses 6 and 7. So you see a great government or a nation burn, like, uh, burning with fire, which we saw fire referring to a destructive judgment. So we have another judgment, another um, nation, another government is bringing destruction upon who? Upon who? The sea. Revelation 17, verse 15, tells us that a sea is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And we were talking about already, this is focusing specifically on Rome. Rome is once again receiving this judgment. And now we need to understand, like, we understand that this sea is representing those peoples, multitudes, nations, or this inhabited area in Rome. So we need to understand who this great government or nation is. Who could this be? We've got to kind of understand this. We know it's not Alaric because Alaric was symbolized as the hail and fire. And you see this other part is, is um, hail and fire mingled with blood. The difference between the two is that Alaric was actually trying to, if you look at history, he was trying to assimilate into Rome. They were trying to assimilate into Rome, but Rome, for one reason or the other, they, they were not accepting. And as a result, Alaric turns and sacks Rome. So... We need to understand what party had this great kingdom that was used to bring judgment upon Rome. So if you look in history here, Genseric or Geyseric, uh, he was a king of the Vandals. And he created the first kingdom on Roman soil in 429 AD. So in the Vandals, they actually sacked Rome in 455 AD. Um, so keep in mind here, I'm kind of giving you events here. But I don't want you to just focus on specifically on the events. There, they have entire eras here in which they did this. They weren't just you know raised up and then just do this one thing and that's it. So there are certain time periods. I'm gonna kind of lay it out here, for example. So for example, the Alaric and the Gospels between 395 and 419 A.D. and Genseric and the Vandals I mentioned is between 419 and 456 A.D. So I'm just kind of giving you events to kind of give you an example of kind of what was going on and focusing specifically on the judgment upon Rome. I don't want you to just kind of like look at some of these events because we go into it. You're going to go on while we're going backwards a little bit. So I want to kind of give you, prepare you in advance for that. Okay. So we see here that Genseric, king of the Vandals, he sacked Rome in 455 AD. And now we kind of have to look at what's going on here with verse 9. So we see that the third part of the sea became blood. So as a result of them sacking Rome during this time period, many Romans were killed. When this, like, uh, the waters became blood, of course, represents them being killed. In verse 9, it says, And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So we kind of have to look at this here. We understand automatically, based on what we talked about in relation to the trumpets, this represents the Christians. The creatures which were in the sea and had life died. So we understand that sea to represent, of course, the inhabited area, the people of Rome. But there were creatures that were in the sea and they had life. This is actually referring to Christians in Rome. They were in the sea, but they were not of the sea. You saw in the earlier verse, you had the trees upon the earth. The trees were on the earth but they were not in the earth. Do we all see where I'm kind of going here? They are, this is like referring to uh, creatures who have life. It's referring to Christians. He describes them like this in these two verses because it shows them how they live among men without becoming a part of them. They were in the world, but not of the world. So you can see that in, in John 17, 14, and 15, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 14. And then it says a third part of those ships were destroyed. I'm just giving you references so you, so you can go back and look. But if you look at 2 Chronicles 20, 37, it talks about the ships referring to the works of men. So it's referring to their possessions, their works, their possessions. So in this time period, during this judgment, there were many Christians who were killed, and many of their works, their possessions were destroyed. So throughout this entire time period, when they're suffering on these judgments, the Christians, at, unfortunately, made no attempt to restore their connection to the Word of God, like going back and studying the Word of God in relation to these things. You, don't, you see no um, effort on their part, at least on its part, to go back and study these things out and try to get ready for the next judgment and the next. They just, it, unfortunately, it just, it, it didn't, it didn't turn back to, and as a result, they're suffering under this. 
Let's go to um, verse 10. And it reads, Revelation 8 verse 10 reads, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And verse 11, I'm sorry. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So we see a lot that's going on here. We see a few, like a few elements here. We see that great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. And who did it fall upon? The third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. So you see party number two, third part of the rivers, and party number three, the fountains of waters. So you see those three parties. So what's going on here? What is this star from heaven? A, a star is referring to their top leader, their star of the show, their mighty one. And this burning, as it were, a lamp, we're going to kind of get into that one. I'm going to hold off on that one for a second. We're going to come right back to it. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers. We're seeing, once again, the waters representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And we see the fountains of waters. This, these were the, the source, the supply of the waters. So this third part of the rivers symbolizes the Christians. And the fountains of waters represents, once again, Rome. So we kind of have to look at this. Who is this great leader? This great leader is actually pretty interesting because he brings a, he says, it burning as it were a lamp. And it made me wonder, what is happening here? Why is it referring to him, you know, bringing like a, this, what, what does it mean he's burning as it were a lamp? I, 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 I was trying to really understand this. So when you look at this, it's talking about the Romans were actually intending to retake the land by the Vandals, but they had to abandon that to combat the Huns in 444 AD. Attila the Hun. Who knows about Attila the Hun? Who's ever heard of Attila the Hun? So he's a great star. He's a, he's a top leader. He's very much well known. And he concentrated his efforts on Eastern Rome, but he turned to Western Rome in 449 AD when Honoria, um, this, these are Roman officials, Roman, like a Roman court here, Valentinian III's sister, she offered him half the Western Empire if he would rescue her from a marriage her brother was forcing her into. So he crosses the Rhine in 451, and he's wreaking havoc in Gaul. And if you read the history on Attila the Hun, it's actually pretty interesting here. It's actually, you know, he's a, it, it, there's a reason why they say he's a burning, as it were, a lamp. If you look at um, Psalms 119, 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and like a, a light into my path. And if you look in Genesis 15, verse 17, it talks about how this, like, uh, this um, lamp passes between the pieces of those covenant animals that Abraham had offered before the Lord when they were sealing that covenant. So we see here that it's, it's, it's kind of like burning as it were God himself. What does it mean by that? We talk about how that burning represents judgment. So Christians in the 5th century called Attila the scourge of God. He earned this name from the ability that he had to kill with impunity and reduce entire cities to dust. Remember, God used fire and brimstone to turn entire cities to dust in the days of Abraham. Exactly when the Lord appeared to Abraham as passing between the pieces as a lamp. So Attila was destroying cities in Rome as if he were bringing judgment upon them like God did on Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's pretty severe. So now we see that we kind of get an understanding here is that this is falling upon Rome here. And the Christians, of course, were affected as well. And you're going to see this actually looking at um, verse 11. I thought this was actually pretty interesting here. Um, like it says, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, we've got to kind of look at this, so we're going to, like, we're going to kind of have to break this verse down a little bit, in a bit of a different way. So I'm going to kind of read it out for you, and you'll kind of see the connection. So why is he referred to as wormwood in this prophecy? And for us to be able to get that, it talks about Lamentations 3.15. Um, Lamentations 3.15 talks about how Jeremiah... Like was filled with your wormwood, and if you look at the, the Hebrew definition, it's about chastisement of the Lord. He lamented the destruction of Jerusalem. The name of the star is actually called chastisement. 
And many of the people, many of the men died of the waters because they are made bitter. And so we have, have to look at this here. When you look at the great star, how it fell upon the rivers and the waters, so what we're going to do is we're going to break this verbiage down between 10 and 11. I'm going to read it for you so you can kind of see the combination. And it says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, going to the verse of 11, and the third part of the waters became wormwood. Do you see how we, we mix that up a little bit, how you put it, like you, you connected the two? And you look at the second one, and it fell upon the fountains of waters, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So you kind of see the combination here. You see how he's affecting each one. So Attila had an effect on each of these parties, upon the Christians and the Romans of that time period. So we're going to talk about the Christians first, how it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and the rivers became wormwood. The Christians became wormwood. They became chastisement. They were as Jeremiah, filled with the chastisement of the Lord as they lamented the destruction that Attila brought upon them. And then you see Attila, this, he fell upon the fountains of waters, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Attila fell upon the Western Roman Empire, and as a result, many men, uh, the Roman armies were made bitter against the Hunnic forces, and they attacked the Huns with prejudice after Attila's death in 453 AD. So we're kind of seeing the connection here. It's how he's affecting everyone. So let's go into the final portion here, um, going to verse 12. And it says, In the fourth, Revelation 8, verse 12 reads, excuse me, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now this one, you know, I kind of have to admit, the Lord, I was kind of struggling with this one here. And the Lord kept showing me that that's not right. That's not right. It's like, why is that not right? All the elements are there. And sun, moon, and stars are there. <laughs> and he took me to Revelation 12, verse 1, and it talks about, of course, the woman who was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So the, um, it, kind of just made, it, it really did kind of like uh, give me a bit of a reality check. When you look at this, who is this talking about? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Who is this talking about? The sun. Like uh, if you look at Psalms 84, verse 11, and Malachi 4, verse 2, it talks about Jesus' righteousness. You look at the moon, it talks about his law, the laws of God. If you look at Isaiah 30, verse 26, Deuteronomy 4, verse 8, and Romans 7, 11, you'll come to the conclusion that the moon reflects the light of the sun. And what is a reflection of, the, of God? His law. The third part of the stars in Genesis 37, verse 9, and Daniel 10, verses, chapter 8, verses 10 and verse 24, it's referring to God's people. So what's happening here? We know it's not, like if you look at the sun, moon, and stars references in the scriptures, you'll see most of them referring to the coming of the day of the Lord. But it can't be the day of the Lord they're talking about here because, number one, the Germanic tribes can't smite the day of the Lord. That can't happen. This prophecy also has been focusing on the warring parties in the Christian church. It's not going to add another element in. We're focused specifically on how it, this, these warring parties are affecting the Christians. So if you look at John 9, verse 5, it talks about how the day is going to come where no man can work. The day came for the church that no man could work. They couldn't work the works of him that sent them because this was a time where the Roman church was smitten. You know, what smote them? They could no longer share the gospel in Rome. What smote them? If you look at verse 12, you know how we talk about this point, about how those two parties are warring against one another and how the Christian churches were affected? It only, this verse, verse 12, only focuses on the Christians. Where's Rome? Where'd they go? They're not there anymore because this last party brought the destruction of Rome. Rome is not there anymore. The church is still around. It's unable to work for a time, but it's written. It's, it's going to continue its work after that passing of that, um, that third day of, of day, a third of day and the night. But this is the destruction of Rome. The destruction was finally come in 476 AD. Now, what does the breakup of Ro the Roman Empire point to? Have you thought about that? What did the breakup of the Roman Empire point to? 
the destruction of the Roman Empire, what does it point to? I didn't even see myself going to this. This is where the Lord, this is how you know the Lord, I didn't see this one coming. What does the breakup of the Roman Empire point, point to? After the fall of the empire in 476 AD, the land was divided into what will become the ten kingdoms. The Ostrogoths, the Goths, the Vandals, the Heruli, the Suevi, the Burgundians, the Lombards, the Visigoths, the Alemanni, and the Franks. Three of these kingdoms would eventually move out of the way to give rise to a reformed Roman Empire that would usher the kingdoms of Europe into the Dark Ages. Now, this is actually really interesting. The signs that can be seen in Daniel, in the image of Daniel chapter 2, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, and 19, verse 26. The ten toes and the ten horns both symbolize the ten kingdoms that arose from the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The three kingdoms that fell were the same ones that sacked and burned Rome. The Goths, the, Ver like, um, the Heruli, and the Vandals, they all sacked and burned Rome, and they were all overthrown by this power. So the Huns were overthrown before this time, so they weren't included. But those other three, you can kind of see like a bit of a revenge thing, don't you think? You know, it's like, you know, you overthrew us, we're getting revenge. <laughs> and this is kind of where we cap off in verse 13. I don't, you're not ready for this one. Uh, let's go for Revelation 18, 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Are you ready for this one? Go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. We got to read this one. Go to Revelation 14, verse 6. Let me know if you're all there. Revelation 14, verse 6. I'm going there too. This is going to be good. All right. Revelation 14, verse 6 reads, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, if you look at that language in Revelation 14, verse 6, and you compare it to Revelation 8, 8 verse 13, don't they sound similar? You see another angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel. And now you see that he sees an angel flying in the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're, all, they, they're very similar. And that's for a reason. One, you see in Revelation 14, verse 6, the angel flies in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to the world. That's the beginning of the three angels' messages. And in Revelation 8, verse 13, the angel flies in the midst of heaven having a pronouncement of woe to the inhabitants of the earth, beginning with the three trumpets, the three woes, which you'll hear referred to. Angels flying in the midst of heaven. That symbolizes the character of the message. So this is important for us to understand. It's not referring to a literal angel. The gospel is preached by men, not by angels. If you look at Matthew 18, 28, verse um, 18 through 20, who was that great commission given to? It was given to men. It was given to his followers. It was not given to the angels. They are ministering spirits. They're not the preachers. It is a divine message that goes to the whole world. So you see a parallel here. The message of the three trumpets went global as the, me as, went as, global as the message of the three angels. It went global. The three angels' messages came to the world's attention through the second advent movement of the 1800s. Are you familiar with this? So if those of you who are not familiar, today is October 22nd, 2022, 178 years later after the Great Disappointment during the Second Advent Movement. So you see a, a harmony here. And we're saying that the message of the three trump the, these trumpets, the, the three trumpets that will follow, that it went global. So when did the message of the three woes go global? When did it go global? In 1838. 1838. Josiah Litch, a leader in the Second Advent movement, released an exposition of Revelation chapter 9 that predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire. It, it will fall on August 11th, 1840. And at the exact time given, the nation of Turkey accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe 
under the control of Christian nations. So we're seeing this when the word got out about this prophecy and its fulfillment as predicted. The second advent movement that was proclaiming the three angels' messages at that time greatly extended. It greatly increased. You can look at that. If you read Great Controversy, I encourage you to read that book. It's on page 334 and 335. You can see it right there. And I was looking at this as far as what does it mean about this woe? It's a primary exclamation of grief. So he's giving this, this is a message of grief to the inhabitants of the earth. And it's saying that up until this point, it was pagan Rome that was, you know, that was the target, like, you know, the, the folks on this judgment. But now, as it indicated, the sound of the fourth trumpet, what the Western Rome no longer existed after it fell in 476 AD. It no longer existed. As such, a prophecy now shifts from Western Rome to Eastern Rome. The trumpeters were serving as symbols of the times of war and how they affected the church has not changed. The parties, as we will see in a future study, that warred against Rome have changed. This message is a message of grief and sorrow because the impact of these three trumpets will be greater than the ones before it. We're going to cover these in a future lesson, but for now, it's important to understand something here. I've, I've stressed this earlier in the message. But it was a study in the application of God's word that would have saved the Christian church those many years ago. When Rome was sacked in 410 AD, when Rome was sacked in 455 AD, when Rome was destroyed in 476 AD, had they put the study and put the word of God into practice, the Christians could have been saved through all of those times. They had all those times. And look what happened before then, the time of Pat Roman peace between 27 B.C. and 180 A.D., that time where Christians rose to power in 313 A.D. with the Edict of Milan. So the Christians had all this time of peace, all this peace time to study and put into practice the words of God that, are, that were available since A.D. 90. Over 320, almost 320 years to study and put the word of God in practice their own lives, to study these prophecies out. And what happened? They didn't do it. And what happened? They suffered under the judgments. We are presumptuous sometimes. We are presumptuous. And what do I mean by that? It's because we think that we, we, you know, we skirt studying the word of God and putting it into practice in our own lives. And we think that, well, God's going to be with us. He's going to get us through. What happened to the Christians back then? They will tell you. They were not studying and putting the words of God in practice in their own lives. They were still his people, but they were not doing what they should have been doing. And as a result, they were not exempt from suffering under this judgment. Complete difference. We're presumptuous. We think that we're not going to study what God's going to be with us. He's going to be with us. He's going to see us through. I have faith. That is presumption. That is not faith. And... What, ha like, what happened to the church back then? They were constantly suffering, like, constantly being desolated, constantly being killed. And here we are on the cusp of Christ coming. And we have to plead and beg and pull teeth for people to study the word of God. To live up to their calling, to understand, you know, the foundations of their faith. We have to sit and plead every time. You guys hear these messages Every single week, you have messages all across the internet, thousands if not millions of messages by now, constant testimonies. And it is so hard for people to go back and study the word of God and put it into practice. The prophecies are completely ignored. We don't study the prophecies. And we think that God is going to just bring us through and that's going to be it. For this, they are willingly ignorant. I mean, I don't know how to stress this any more than I have, but... You have got to overcome this presumption that you have that God is going to bring you through even though you are willingly turning away from his word. The means by which you can be warned in advance that these things are coming. We have had these scriptures for hundreds, uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years. We have had the opportunity to study these things out for ourselves and find out what's going to happen before we get there. The scriptures can interpret themselves. There are plenty of resources for you to be able to understand these things for yourself. But many of us will not do it. 
And how do I know that many of us will not do it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 tells us there's going to be a great falling away first. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 says that many are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We're coming on Halloween right now. How many Christians are going to keep Halloween, going towards those seducing spirits, listening to going to those seances and communicating with the dead, experimenting with all those dark arts that God has told you in his word not to do any, have anything to do with? Completely ignoring the word of God for these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are we doing here? What, like, you know... You had the prophecy. They told you these things were coming. And as a result, you go right into there and you're wondering why God is not going to deliver you because you are knowingly turning away from his word. This is truth, everyone. I don't know what else to say to you that will help you understand. I, I mean, I may have given you these, uh, you know, through the Lord, given you this understanding of the four trumpets here, but it will not do you any good if you do not go back and study these things. It will not do you any good. You can tell me that you have faith all you want, but if you do not study these things, they will avail you nothing. We are reaching out to you. We are asking you. We are willing to study with you. You do not have to do this by yourself. We are more than willing to study with you so you can know in advance what these things are before they get here. Daniel 12 verse 1 tells us that a time of trouble is coming, such as there was since there was not a nation. And how many of us are going to go in that time of trouble thinking that God's going to see us through, that love is all we need, and somehow we're going to, God is going to bring us through as we are completely ignorant, taking the mark of beast in ignorance, and thinking that God is going to bring us to heaven. That is presumption. That is destruction, everyone. I cannot stress it any more than this. So I'm going to encourage you, once again, if you want to study these things out, please reach out to us. Please leave a comment on YouTube. Please leave a comment on Facebook. Please come to Greater Atlanta, Seventh-day Adventist Church, 4552 Highland Road, Decatur, Georgia, 30035. We are willing to study with you. We're having a Bible study today at 3 p.m. Come ask questions. We are more than willing to study with you. We have to lay this out, everyone. We have to be firm here because what happens is, is that you're going to listen to this and you're going to think, man, I was really blessed by this study, but then do nothing with it. Then do nothing with it. And God is pleading every single week, every single day, every single testimony that someone gets put on social media so you can read it, so you can listen to it, so you can study Every attempt is going to be made. No one is going to be able to go into those time periods without having been warned, having the opportunity to learn these things and what they mean. No one's going into that time ignorant. If you choose to go into that time ignorant, it's because you are willingly ignorant. I say this in love because at the end of the day, I don't want a single soul out there to die. This is a matter of life and death. Do we all understand that here? This is a matter of life and death. And for us to be able to receive life and not the second death, we are going to have to buckle down and study. We're going to have to come to class. We're going to have to learn at Jesus' feet, just like it did back in the days of the early church. They were willing, able, and wanting to go learn at Jesus, with Jesus every single day. And we think because Jesus is not physically here that we're not getting that same experience. You think that Jesus is going to come down and then you're going to go learn at his feet? I got news for you. A false Jesus is coming and the false leaders are, these leaders are going to go learn at the false Jesus' feet. And if you're not careful, if you don't get, if you don't get ahead of this, you're going to be learning at that false Jesus' feet and persecuting God's people in that time of trouble written of in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. That's going to be you. That falling away, it's like many of the Christians are going to fall away. I have to lay this, I have to make it plain because I don't want you to just get tied up in an uh, amount of facts. I'm not just giving you facts. A lot of people don't study Revelation because they don't understand the symbols. They feel like they, they, they can't figure it out. But this is the reason why this book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is revealed to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29, it tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, 
but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. They may do all the words of this law. The revelation has been revealed. In the first part of the book, it says, bless those who hear, keep, and, you know, read, hear, and keep the words of this prophecy by the time it's at hand. It is not a sealed book. You can't fly by under that excuse. You can understand it. It has been revealed to you. It is meant to be understood. And I encourage you to begin understanding it today. Don't wait till later. Don't wait till next Sabbath. Don't wait till next week. Don't just keep putting it off. Make time. If you have time to, to listen to all the social media out there, all these social media influencers, all these little videos we watch on TikTok, if you got time for all that, you got time to open up a Bible and to study the prophecies that God has given you. Which one is more important, TikTok or God? I'm going to, it's ultimatum here, TikTok or God, Facebook or God, Snapchat, Instagram or God. Which one is it going to be? Which one, like, which one is going to save you? Which one is going to give you eternal life? Because if you're telling me that you've had all these opportunities and you have not taken them, you cannot blame God. A lot of people are going to blame God when it comes down to this. They're going to blame God. Why are they not saved? Why, were, why are they on the other side of the city? God's going to show them. I sent you this message. I sent you this study. You have this, you have this person here right now teaching you these things right now, and you just clicked away. You just pressed the back button, and that was that. All these opportunities are going to flee before you, are going to be shown before you. You're going to realize that you did not value your own salvation. You did not value your own soul. You underestimated the love and mercy and justice of Christ. Everyone thinks that God is too good and loving a God to send people to the final judgment. Have you read your Bible? Did you look at the flood? Did you look at Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you look at the destruction of Jerusalem twice? Did you look at these things? Did you study this? Because God is not going to spare those who will not cooperate with him. He wants to cooperate with you. He is constantly telling you every day, John 3, 16, for God, son of God, he loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Every single time. That is the most famous quote in modern history right now and every single time it is not just the world it is not just the wicked who ignore it it is God's own people who turn from this what can I say what else can I say that will bring life to your conviction what other words can the spirit give me that will help you understand if you see the Spirit moving me to give you this warning, it means that he values your soul more than you do. He values your salvation more than you do. And it is nothing short of a miracle that God is taking so much time, expressing so much patience, giving so many warnings for the world to wake up. We are in the West we are in Western countries. Over there in the East, they are having troubles that are infinitely worse than what we're dealing with. They know what persecution is. They know what hardship is. Right now, we are in relative comfort, relative ease. We are on our armchairs, sitting back saying, God's not going to do that. But when that time of trouble comes, you're going to realize that God has been serious. God has been serious. He has told you over and over again. And... You know, I think I've said enough. I think I've said enough. And I'm going to let this sit with you. I'm going to encourage you once again to study the word of God and to put it into practice in your own life. Study these prophecies. Get to understand these prophecies. You're going to be warned of these events before they come to pass. Don't be willingly ignorant or you will fall away. You will be deceived. Let us pray, everyone, because the trumpet has sounded. Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing us with your word today. Thank you, Lord, for sounding the trumpet, sounding the warning that you are coming. And we pray, O oh Lord, that this message will work in the hearts of those who have heard it, wherever they are in this world. I pray, Lord, that it will reach their ears, their hearts, and their minds, and their, even their imaginations 
Grip them, O oh God. Show them the truth that they will be saved, that they will arise, O oh Lord, and for their salvation is near. Arise and study. Arise and repent and turn from their sins. Turn from these things that come on Halloween, that they will not go to these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They may be deceived by these spirits, deceived by these Ouija boards, among other things. Glorify your name, O oh God. Help people to study this Halloween. Help them to get ready for the Reformation Day when the Word of God came back to us. Please bring the word of God back in our lives. We ask these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>